See, there's a lot of ninja weapons that you as a professional, especially you out there as ninjutsu specialists, that you don't know about. And that robot arm is one of them. Is a oh, well, I bet you Frank Gibbs knows all about that. He's a ninjutsu specialist. Somebody. It's just a, a fantasy thing I came up with and said, why couldn't he have that in one of his arsenals? You know, yeah, like, interesting. I you think know. we'll have to ask Frank Dukes about this stuff someday. If these are real ninja stuff, he, he's the expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll try it. Hey guys, welcome to Ninja Secrets from Revenge of the Ninja. This is actually part two. Make sure to check out part one where I did five facts you didn't know about Revenge of the Ninja. This is part two, the other five facts. I'll link that original video in the description below. But today's guest is Steven Lambert, who played the Silver Mask Ninja, Devil for Show Kasugi, was also the stunt coordinator. Make sure to check out his book, by the way, from the streets of Brooklyn to the halls of Hollywood. I'll link it in the description below. You can pick it up from Amazon. Pretty cool book. It's got really great uh, stories on all kinds of things, especially on a lot of canon films such as this one. But anyway, if you like this kind of content, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell notification so you can see whenever I put out new content. With all that said, let's find out more about this canon films classic. Uh, number six, one of the more popular scenes in the movie, the sequence involving Cho Osaki and a moving van took a full week to shoot. So that whole van sequence, did that take... Did you guys do that in one week or? It's a long sequence. If you think of it, it is a long sequence with the fighting and running after the van and, yeah. you know, yeah. so that just took one week to shoot essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh normal people, it would have took, uh, probably three months. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It would have probably took a while. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I was blessed. I did it most myself. I didn't have to worry about worrying meaning doubling Shokazuki in that. Yeah. Um, I didn't have to worry about other people's uh, um, life. You know, I knew what I could do. So there were a lot of things I did in, in longer sequences rather than cutting. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, because if you get the longer take, then obviously the production time's a lot shorter. Yes. So when you, or when Shokazuki's character is running after the van, in like jumping and flipping over walls was that you that's me and that's did they just have this springboard that launched you in the air where you would do your aerial and then uh yeah a mini tramp i had okay. a i had a mini tramp on um uh, on a table like lunch table right yeah uh, not a normal lunch table on the table that uh you know the lunch from the movie would uh, bring i yeah, just sure save money i just moved the lunch put a put a trampoline on it and i put so so this is the this is the the table many tramps up here i put another table or two or three behind it so i can get up on it run 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 oh interesting and go over the wall you ne you never saw the beginning of that you only saw show doing this cut and then you see the other side of him going over now, you were pretty high up in the air. Did you land on like a crash mat or something? Put the camera low to the ground and it looks, it looks 10, 15 feet higher. Yeah, but again though, so did you just land on the ground or did you land on a, on a crash no, mat? I landed on the ground. Oh, you did? Yeah, I landed on the ground. Oh, the way they shot it though, you're saying it just made it look probably higher than it actually was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it was impressive watching that scene. It's like, yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Tricks. Good tricks, yeah. Yeah, okay, so a whole, just a week to shoot everything. Uh, the next it, it, one. It, you know what you're doing, and when you have the right team, you know, props were, you know, we were lucky, Cannon was lucky, Sam Furstenberg was always smart. You know, the people that he worked, Every person, I would say a good 85% of the, the people who worked on a Sam Furstenberg film, he knew. He knew their work. So okay. he knew he was going to get things done. And you have, to, you have to know people that you can get that could wing it sometimes. Sure. And don't take, you know, three hours to do something that really could be done in a minute. And that's... 
you know, the three hours normally on most films, you know, that's usually how long it takes. Yeah, you wouldn't have the luxury anyway on Canon, so it really kind of helped you and be really efficient. Helps. Yeah, if you don't know how to do it quick, I learned a lot of things before that I took to Canon. You know, I learned the old school way. So mm. that's why one of the reasons why I was so admired is because, you know, I, they didn't have to wait for me an hour, you know, two hours, or we can't do it. We have to wait until next week. You okay. know, I figure out a way how to do it without a special piece of equipment or, uh, you know, waiting for a rig to come in or, or whatever. Sure. Interesting. All right. Uh, here we go. The longest sequence to shoot was the final rooftop battle between Shokasuki and then you, Silver Mask Ninja. So how long did that take to shoot that? I, I know there's like a part where I think you were in the jacuzzi. Um, that's a long sequence. So it's a long sequence. It was great, but uh, we, we did it in parts and big parts. Um, uh, different sections. Jacuzzi was one section. Uh, there was a lot going on in the jacuzzi, working on the jacuzzi. So what we did was we went from the beginning, the, the very first moment when he was looking at me. That's mm. the first thing. I shot that in sequence. Okay. The very first thing was on top uh, and he's looking for me. We're on top of the roof and he's in between the cracks at the edge of the roof and he's looking for me and all of a sudden I come out that's that's where we started and we took things the way i wrote them for sam furstenberg uh and us in the movie and we just went as you see it is as we shot it we didn't jump oh because interesting. It's such a long sequence the entire thing on the rooftop and it was in different areas of that rooftop in other words you know it wasn't different rooftops that whole thing was shot from the time he was looking for me, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the doors come open, those metal doors, I shot that in reverse. I was actually standing on the edge and the doors were open. Uh, there are two doors that are on the floor where Shokuzuki pops in. Okay. And the doors were open and I was out on the ledge and I jumped backwards and I went inside um disappeared and then the doors closed mm. i reversed the film the doors open i pop out and land on the ledge it's a trick movie trick yeah now that's a really epic scene so some of the stuff there like who came up with it so for example like when shokasugi cuts the silver ninja in half and it's almost like just a fake dummy you know what i'm talking that about that was a first idea oh that, that, that was, was his idea Denver. okay yeah, I thought I, I thought that was silly. It was interesting because you're thinking like, how did he? Well, whatever, they're ninjas. Let just let it go. But what about the? Um, it was almost like there was like a, a robot or a cyborg ninja in the jacuzzi because show cuts the arm off and then there's just like a robot arm. Like whose idea that, was that? That was an idea I wrote in the script. But uh, uh, Sam thought of the the split, and yeah. the reason why I thought it was silly is because you never see. And not, not the split was silly, but after the fact, you just see like two figures on the floor, as you remember, you know, two, two plastic figures. Sure. And I, I would say, why not reveal me like half of the mask uh, and, and go off and fight now with just maybe half of a mask, you know, and, and work it that way, never seeing, you know, another half, mm. uh, the other half. But, I mean, that, could be, uh, that would have been interesting. Uh, Shmulek thought that was uh, silly um, <laughs> and funny. He liked it. Uh, and I agreed with them. But uh, come to find out I was wrong. People love that. I mean, it's, an, it, it's a funny scene. And it's, uh, I mean, you go on YouTube and they have these little things where, where you can go to like a happy face. But it's a, uh, uh, you know, you can go to a right in like a ninja film. And all of a sudden it'll appear where where I'm looking at him and he looks back and I, I, I unreveal myself, you know, and then it cuts to the, him cutting me, the character in the mask and it splits in half. I mean, it's a famous scene. People love that scene. Yeah. Yeah. It's memorable. I mean, I thought, it was silly. I thought it was silly and it didn't make any sense, but what do I know? 
<laughs> but you came up with the robot arm and the jacuzzi that he cuts off. Which was very difficult to do because I had to do it. Everything has to be done the cheap way. Yeah, of course. So what I simply did was, you know, get a, get a, um, uh, a dummy, you know, just a fake mannequin and just take off the arm add props to it and just, uh, you know, make up the arm and put it in the ninja outfit. And I was holding the arm, the bottom. That's all mm -hmm. I was doing. Was the idea that the ninja has like this cyber ninja that he works with or like, what was the no, idea behind it, coming up with that? It's all fantasy. It, it was, it's a, one of my many ninja tools, many of my ninja weapons. See, there's a lot of ninja weapons that you as a professional, especially you out there as ninjutsu specialists that you don't know about. And that robot arm is one of them. Is a secret. Oh, well, I bet you Frank I'm Dukes going. knows all about that. I'm He's going. the ninjutsu specialist. Oh, it's just a, a fantasy thing I came up with and said, why couldn't he have that one of his arsenals? You know? Yeah, and interesting. I you think know? we'll have to ask Frank Dukes about this stuff someday if these are real ninja stuff. He, he's the expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the Dukes, you know, the, uh, the man who uh, makes some big mistakes in his life. Okay, Dukes, you know why we're here. Taking you back, Frank. Let's go. Only when the committee is over. Frank, read my lips. We are taking you back now. Yeah, you know, I've uh, I've experienced and I've heard about uh, a very sad guy, but uh, you know, let's move on. Let's yeah, not talk yeah, about let's it. move on from from Dukes. Um, okay, number eight. Uh, most of the film was shot in Salt Lake City, Utah, although some scenes were shot in Los Angeles, where the story is set. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought the entire film was shot in Salt Lake City because it was a lot cheaper. Do you guys shoot some of it? I, I guess in California, Shirley Temple's house, you must have shot that in, exactly. in California. Then. Correct. Yeah. Was that Correct. the only scene shot in California? And did you guys shoot the that rest was, in Utah? That was the only scene. That was the only scene, yes. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, yeah. All right, number nine. One of Canon's early movie posters for Revenge of the Ninja had martial artist Keith Vitale as a star of the movie. Vitaly would play David Hatcher, a cop in front of show in Revenge of the Ninja. Dave Hatcher, Lieutenant Dime. I understand you want to get involved. Vitaly was also an American kickboxer once. So, yeah, I was actually pretty impressed with Keith Vitaly, you know, rewatching this as I'm older. I only seen it like a long time ago as a kid up until recently. Um, but, yeah, so were they going to market it, do you know, with him as the star? And was there like a poster with Keith Vitaly? Is that true, or was it always like supposed to be a Shokasugi movie? I, uh, I, I, I do think very highly of uh, Keith Vitale, uh, um, professionally and personally. He's a very good man and a very fine martial artist. I know nothing. I've never heard that. That's the first time I've heard of uh, uh, another poster, and and the idea was using show uh, was using a Keith Vitale. But I'll tell you what did occur in the movie is come time uh, like a week before uh, I was ready to kill him as, uh, as a silver mask ninja. I, uh, I met with Sam Furstenberg and I said, you know, because you got to understand a movie like this, a lot of it was being winged as we went along. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of things weren't scripted and because it was a movie like this, a canon movie, if you want to say. Um, a guy like me knew he had certain opportunities that he usually wouldn't have. Um, that's happened to me a lot in one way or another in my career, but particularly in, in, in these movies. And um, a while before we were ready to do that scene with Keith Vitale, I went over to Sam Furstenberg and I said, listen, why do we have to kill Keith Vitale, you know, he's, he's the lead cop in it, you know, yeah. uh, he's the one that communicates with Cho Kazuki and all that. Why don't we keep him, you know, until the end of the movie and show him, you know, coming out at the end with Cho Kazuki and whoever else. And because um, um, nothing was ever set in, in stone. And I said, listen, all I have to do is instead of killing him, just hurt him bad. 
and he goes to the hospital. Sure. You know, next scene we see him coming out of the hospital. You know, uh, uh, we don't have to kill him. You know, and and Sam was thinking about that. He was nice enough to start thinking May, maybe it's a good idea. I said it's a good idea because you have somebody else, uh, you know, a partner, a duel, yeah, you know, two at the end of the movie, and and who knows? I mean, there's talk already about you know doing another movie with Shogazuki. So you're thinking Revenge of the Ninja, they come back together. Yeah, you know? I like this character a lot. No, yeah. I read that in the book. Yeah, they should have um, kept him alive. In fact, yeah. instead of doing the weird story with Ninja 3, The Domination, well, with the finish. Exorcist angle. Let me finish before you move on. Yeah. Uh, uh, please. So, so Sam Furstenberg uh, started thinking about it, which I got really excited about. And he said, maybe not a, not a bad idea. Let me think about it. And I said, it's a good way to go because uh, let me explain to you, instead of killing him, now he's wounded. Mm -hmm. And every time, all those little kills that I'm doing throughout the building and all that, yeah, you know, he's going up to the roof. He's making himself, he's making himself available to go up to the roof. Keith Vitale is. So by the time you kill the Silver Mask Ninja, I can get Keith Vitale up to the roof. And while he's going up to the roof, I can have him kill two or three ninjas. You know, in that respect, so we can cut back and forth. I said, it's a mm -hmm. great idea. And then it's di the dynamic duel, Batman and Robin. Yeah, yeah. you know, win in the day. But, but I, I, you know, instead of uh, Keith Vitale getting up there on top of the roof, um, before Shokuzuki kills the Silver Mask Ninja, he gets there right after he kills him. You know, he kills him. I'm on the floor. Arthur Roberts is on the floor. And then the door comes open to the roof and Keith Vidali pops up with the girl, for, with the girl and, and his son. You know, that's the way I was thinking, presenting it to Sam Furstenberg. And he said, let me think about it. And then a couple mm -hmm. of days later, um, uh, Shmulek, Sam Furstenberg came over to me and said, uh, no, you, you got to kill him. We can't, uh, we can't do it that way. And I said, why? And he said, Sho doesn't want it. Sho Kazuki doesn't want it. I'm sorry. Sho, come on. Oh, was Sho Kazuki wanted him to die? That was his... Oh, see, that. that's interesting, though, because I think it would have been really cool. I liked them together in the movie in, in their friendship. You know, he's one of my favorite characters. And I, I like that he was a cop. He brings Sho, you know, on board to help with the case. Um, I would think it would be really cool if they were like in another movie together and they shouldn't have done Ninja three domination with the word exorcist and aerobic single. It should have been like almost like a double dragon type movie with them both as like the lead. So it's interesting that Shokasui's well, choice was to kill him. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, the, the minute Keith Vitale arrived in the movie, I, I had a lot more to do with him fight wise and get him in scenes. But, uh, you know, I had resistance in it. And that all came from Shokazuki. Even when he, uh, at the beginning, when he's uh, uh, outside the building and he kicks the three cops sure. you know, and runs out. All he does is three kicks and runs in the building. You know, the, the three cops. I had a whole big fight with, with uh, uh, five cops there. While this fight's going on, you know, Shokazuki's, I had that cutting back and forth. But Shokazuki went, came over to me and just simply said, I want this to be minimal. I just want him to, hmm. to kick a couple of guys fast and he runs in. You know, he didn't want to see, he wouldn't let me show, unfortunately. Uh, and at the time, Keith Vitale, he didn't know this. He didn't want me to show Keith Vitale's talents. And, but we uh, still got to see quite a bit of it because when I rewatched the movie, very I'm little, like, considering I, very little is very little. That's interesting. Okay, yeah, very little, hmm. very little. Even even when they were practicing uh, in the school together, uh, you know, I had a lot more in my head, and I had it written down uh, to be put down, and and uh, you know, we we showed uh, we showed very little. That was the, probably the biggest scene between both of them. 
especially in fighting. Okay. But you know what the thing, it wasn't a real fight. So it was a big difference, but I wanted to, I wanted to show Keith, you know, in a more violent way, you know, equal to show Kazuki, but he wouldn't let me, he wouldn't let it happen. And every time I tried, he put a stop to it. And being that was my first introduction, my first movie for Canon, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't realize as I realized after that film, uh, you know, how much, uh, how much um, power that they would let me have, you know, like I had to back off when Shokazuki told me no, because he was the boss. Yeah. The star and of the movie. People, sure. Yeah. People, I, I wasn't going to, at that time, I wasn't as close to the powers as I was, you know, in the middle of the movie of Revenge of the Ninja or the Domination or American uh, Ninja. You know, e e each moment, the more I did from the very beginning, the more I did, the more they listened to me. So Revenge of the Ninja, since it was the first one and it was the beginnings, and, you know, I didn't develop that confidence they had in me where they listened to me more. You know what the irony is, though? If Shokasugi didn't decide to kill Keith Vitale, which when you basically, you, your character is one that killed him, but when, when you basically killed him, I mean, you didn't have to do the final death blow, or even when you did, like, he could have still survived that blade going in him. Obviously, they could have just shot a scene of him getting, you know, pulled out uh, to the hospital. But the irony is that had they not killed him, maybe Ninja 3 Domination wouldn't have ended up being that weird hey, listen, movie. Maybe, maybe they would have used them to, and, and Sho could have had a cooler part in the third Ninja movie. Uh, listen, it could have been rectified very uh, uh, easy, uh, very simple. You know, if you remember the scene when I'm ready to kill him, you know, right after I kill him, Shokazuki arrives. All I had to do is, is instead of showing Shokazuki after I kill him, right before I kill him, and I just knock him out with the butt of the sword. Yeah, that would have been I, fine. Because i got to get away from Shokazuki. Sure. Uh, you know, and now he's knocked out. He can wake up seconds later. That's all you Yeah, after, to after, after Sho kills your character, he could have woken up. So, yeah, it could have been easily rectified, yeah. but... Not after he, not after he kills the... Uh, uh, Shokazuki kills the, the, the Silver Mask Ninja. While he's fighting, he could wake up. Because don't forget, you know, Sho's on... 20 floors above him. That's so true. Has, yeah, yeah. Then he could fight more ninjas like you yeah, mentioned. Sure. Exactly. So I had it all worked out. But hmm. but he didn't want to show wanted to, to be the, you know, for whatever reason. He wanted to be the guy doing all the stuff. Not, uh, he didn't want the Keith Vitale character interfering hmm. and giving him more than, you know, it was scripted. Yeah. Interesting. Shame. Yeah. Which would have been a whole different Everything, like you said, who knows, uh, the domination would have been different, maybe. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, interesting to think about what could have been. But, yeah. um, hey, here goes one, and it mentions you specifically, number 10. Stunt coordinator Stephen Lambert plays the rhinestone cowboy, which is true, we talked about, yes. who gets his mustache oh, chopped maybe, maybe, off. Uh, maybe uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie might have doubled me there. That was him, wasn't it? <laughs> Eddie Suey? Yeah, yeah, I think he yeah. played the cowboy. But <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Suey, by the way, is credited as the Masked Ninja Devil. Uh, that's Stephen Lambert, who played the Silver Masked Devil in the whole movie. So Eddie Suey is one of Shokasugi's friends, uh, but he was never in the movie. However, he is still credited for some reason. So it says, uh, Stunt coordinator Stephen Lambert plays the rhinestone cowboy who gets his mustache chopped off in the playground fight. Lambert also doubled for Shokasugi throughout the movie and for the Silver Mask Ninja as well. So at least this website article talks about you doubling for show in the Silver Mask Ninja. And they don't mention the Eddie, you know, Suey guy who just basically got paid to do nothing. I don't even really work here. Real quick, though, did your mustache get chopped off? I don't remember that in the playground fight. Oh, yeah. You mean, it did? You, don't, you, you weren't watching my terrific acting. I was watching the fight, hey, not so much the mustache, I guess, but I got to rewatch that part. Where he uh, <laughs> takes the, uh, uh, the fan, and to get me away from him, he slices towards my face. And I jump back, and I do this. And I go like this, and then you see me do this, 
and then you cut to the uh, half of the mustache on the floor. And mm. then you cut back to me and I reveal it. Oh, so that's you, how it was done. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But it happened so quick that, that, that you have to play it back a few times. Yeah. I missed it. I missed it when I rewatched it, but, uh, yeah. Because you can't see something like that unless you go close up. Sure. And can't go close up on something like that, you know, if you want the pace to go quick, you know, because there's a fight. You don't want to stop. So you just go boom, boom, just go boom, boom to the ground and then back to re for the reveal. Okay. Um, so yeah. So it sounds like a lot of that, you know, top 10 things you didn't know about Revenge of the Ninja article, a lot of it is accurate. I would say. Well, the stuff you mentioned about me, uh, Dublin Chokazuki and, uh, and uh, the Silver Mask Ninja, that was the, that's why I called them. Yeah, you know, so maybe that's the part he uh, edited you're, you're or updated. Stated, you know, and and I, I don't, like I said, I'm a very easygoing guy, but people, and I've run into this experience two or three times in my life. As a, as a stuntman, as a person, my job is very serious. My job means a lot to me. My job now may sound funny and ridiculous and stupid to people in the audience, but I'm an artist and I consider every bit of my work very special and very meaningful to me. And when somebody tells me or says uh, to somebody or writes something that they didn't do, um, um, and I really did it, it really, really upsets me because you're taking a, uh, a part of my life and saying that I didn't do it. Sure. And, you know, I like to think a hundred years from now, you know, maybe your great, great, great grandson will somehow see something and find out who really did it. And I'll be remembered, you know, uh, you know, my great, great, great grandson, you know, and that's, these are ways to have people remember you a hundred years from now. Sure. And I don't want any mistakes, any confusion because it's my legacy. And I consider myself and my, and my work self, um, you know, everything I do as an artist, just like a painter, if he paints something or a creator, if he creates something, it's it's a nightmare and it's heartbreaking if somebody says something they did and they really didn't. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to, you know, someone to steal their credit for sure. Yeah. I don't even really work here.